Now, I have to be the first to admit to you that a few years ago, uh, we had a change of venue. And at that, in that change of venue, they asked me to preach first. And I, you know, I'm kind of a tunnel vision person. I, I have very narrow focus. And I, I think only about preaching the word of God. Amen. In fact, when we get in our car to drive to church, I, I don't even speak to my wife. I don't, think it's, I don't want music on, nothing. I'm thinking about what I'm going to say. And because you know you preach three sermons, one before you get there, one when you get there, and one after you get there, or after you're done, rather. Um, so I focus on that. And so that time, that Sunday, I got up and I preached. And then the next person came up, and they introduced their wife and thanked the Lord for their wife. <laughs> And the score was one to nothing. <laughs> and after that, bar was said, every man that got up and preached thanked the Lord for his wife, which was further condemnation for me. So, after refusing to look in her direction because I didn't want the knives coming at me anymore, uh, I, I just said I'm sorry. And so, today, I mean, I, <laughs> I am deeply honored to have my wife with me today. <laughs> Thank you. And Friday will be 44 years. And, you know, we pray together each week. I, I always thank the Lord for her. And number one, for putting up with me, because that's not easy. But she's done that graciously for almost 44 years. And I, I praise the Lord for her. And all that she's done. All right, enough of that. Uh, I mean, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's all good. <laughs> it's, it's never going to be that I get up to say anything about my wife and don't step in something. <laughs> so, par for the course. Uh, this afternoon, I, I'd like for us to consider uh, just a few things out of this particular passage. I call it Life on the Mend, and hopefully, now see, when other people do that, I say, if it's not Jesus, hang up. I have no idea what that is, but I don't care. <coughs> I guess I should go in the opposite direction. Right. <laughs> this particular passage is an interesting one. Uh, it reminds me of a story that I read last year. You know, just about a year ago, in August of 2023, they had this fire uh, in Maui. And of course, at that particular, in, in that time, there over 115 people, I believe, perished. And uh, there were, at one time, over 300 missing and all of that. It was a horrific event, but then when the news people began to talk about it, the thing that stood out in my mind was the fact that they talked about how the community was galvanized to care about this community, and how they, they came together from all over and marshaled resources and everything to get that community back on its feet. Just a, a wonderful, wonderful story. I thought about that uh, as I was reading this passage, uh, primarily because I thought about the ministry of Jesus. The two words describe the mission of Jesus, and thus his body, the church. And those two words are the same two words that came to my mind when I thought about the event in Maui. Now, uh, those words are recovery and restoration. You know Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And, of course, in Luke 4, Jesus goes in to uh, the temple there, and they give him the scroll, and he finds the place where uh, uh, Isaiah, the place in Isaiah's scroll where he unrolls it and reads these verses from Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has appointed me to preach good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, 
and that the blind will see, and that the downtrodden will be free from their oppressors, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And he's talking about recovery and restoration. That was his mindset. That's why he came. And because that's why Jesus came, then we are the body of Christ. In fact, uh, at the ordination that we had just, well, I guess it's been four years ago now, uh, at Ed's ordination, uh, one of the pastors challenged him because he asked him about his own mission statement and what he believed was important for him to do. And after he, Ed was done, he referenced this passage and he says, well, you didn't say anything about any of this. And ever since that, I've been rethinking, okay, Lord, if I'm going to be like Jesus, then I need to expand my understanding of what the Great Commission looks like. Mm -hmm. It's not just preaching sermons of people, but it's, it's interacting in the lives of people. And so I, I in fact, I share with my church my own personal mission statement. My purpose in life is to grow deeper in my relationship with my Lord. You know, 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says, you've been called into fellowship with God and with his son, Jesus Christ. That's my first calling. Not to do, and I think it was Warren Wiersbe that says, you know, we're not called human doings. We're called human beings. And my first calling is, is to be with him, that I might learn from him and be like him, and then cooperate with his spirit and becoming more like him in my character. And then share those results as he conforms me to the image of Christ. Share those results with others, both in and beyond my relationship circles, and helping them become like him and like me. I want to point them to him, but then... Paul says in Philippians 4, 9, the things that you both learned and received in me and learned and received and seen and heard in me. He says, do. And the God of peace will be with you. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Well, that presupposes then that I'm following Christ so that then I'm leading people to where God wants them to be. People come into the world, we're all in recovery. Because sin damaged us at conception. And so we come into the world broken, bruised, battered, beaten, and all the other bees. And as a result, we're all in recovery. And we, we need the Lord's grace and strength, his salvation, his forgiveness, his cleansing, etc., etc. And so my, my mission, my personal mission is to grow. In Matthew 4, there is this statement, well, there's this passage that talks about Jesus calling his first disciples. And it says that he found, well, I probably put the passage there somewhere, but that's all right. I'll reference it to you. He calls, you know, Peter and his brother, they were, they were in the boat. They were mending their nets. And that's, a, that's an important thing. You know, they, they were fishermen, and so, you know, as you fish, you, you put weights on the nets, you cast the net into the water, you drag it, and you catch the fish, and then you pull it together, and you pull it up on the boat. Well, if the net breaks... There's got to be holes in it because the fish don't just say, oh, okay, they got me. I mean, they fight, right? You may snag something. If there's a hole, then the fish escape. So what happens when they pull the nets in and they see the tears, when they get back to shore, before they dismiss for the day, they have to mend the nets. Because if you don't repair the damage, if there's no recovery... And restoration of the nets, you, you aren't going to be effective as a fisherman. Well, the word for mending is the word that Paul uses for equipping. The church's task is, is to mend broken people. And so, because you know, I begin with me, when I preach, I, I 
prepare first to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? What are you saying to me from the passage? And after I get beat up, I share the grief with the congregation. <laughs> but, I mean, the Lord, he wants to drive his word into my heart. And so I need to listen to his voice. And so I looked at this passage and I say, okay, Lord, how do I mend? What do you do? What are the things that need to happen in order for my life to mend? Because the things that you're doing in my life then become the things that other people need. And, of course, this is where Toby gets that from. There are always how many things? Three things. You know. <laughs> and some preachers always find three things. I mean, I just, Because, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. By earth went, oh, no. Uh, <laughs> my life begins to mend when I recognize in those first three verses the greatness of Christ. And I think that's the most important part. Yeah. And then the gifts to the church. And then the goals of Christian ministry. If I could wrap my mind around those three things, then I think my life can become all that God desires it become. So when you look at the verses 8 through 10, and to do that, I have to put my glasses on. He says, therefore, he says, and he's quoting Psalm 68, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave uh, gifts to men. Now, this he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth, he who descended is the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he's talking about Christ. Christ is a great warrior. He's a great king. And the picture from Psalm 68 uh, is the picture of David taking the ark from the home of Obed-Edom. And he's going up to Jerusalem. And he's going to present the ark. The ark represents the presence of God. And as he's ascending up the hill, God is ascending to his rightful place as ruler over all of the world, all of the universe. And he's bringing that picture to speak of Christ. Christ is ruler over all things. In fact, Paul says he's been given as ruler over all things to the church. I love the way the message makes the statement the church is that's cool. Colossians 2 says, you were dead because of your sins, and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. I appreciated Pastor Clay, um, his statement in the class we took, this last class. Um, it's the, one of the reasons you come to BFA is because there are always other pastors who believe what you believe. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's affirming. And so when I stand up and tell our people, listen, we're not sinners anymore. We used to be sinners, but the Bible never calls a believer a sinner saved by grace. We used to be sinners, but not no more, right? We, we've, been, we've been changed. We've been metamorphosized. We've been transformed. And because God has made a change, he says, there was a time when your sinful nature wasn't cut away. And of course, I'm using the New Living Translation deliberately for the sake of our president. Uh, <laughs> because I know how he loves, you know, anyway. <laughs> then God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all your sins. He canceled the record that contained the, contained the charges against us. He took it and destroyed it by nailing it to Christ's cross. In this way, God disarmed the evil rulers yeah. and authorities. He shamed them publicly by victory over them yeah. on the cross. Yeah. Christ is king. Yeah. And of course, the takeaway for me, and, and I believe in, in the uh, first discipleship course that we teach, it says Christ should hold the same place in my heart that he has over the universe. Yeah. Christ is he's sovereign. Yeah. He's Lord. And, and, and if I'm going to heal like I should, the first thing I have to come to grips with is the fact that Christ is Lord. Yes, Christ yes. is boss. Yes. 
Yeah. He's ruler over everything. I don't have a pocket veto to pull out and eh, I'm not doing that. Whatever he says for me to do, isn't that what Mary said to the servants? When they ran out of wine, the joy juice, she says, whatever he says to you, do it. Good thing they were servants. Servants don't have a vote. So when he says, go and fill up the pots with water, okay, fill up the pot. Draw out and take it to the governor. If you're a servant, you have no choice. So they take it up there, the water, and, and, and the guy tastes it and said, man, this is the best stuff. The servants knew what happened. But they were obedient. Yeah. One of the things I, 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 I tell you, I praise God for, is my dad. My dad, um, well, there were a number of things about my dad <laughs> that, um, well, that I won't address. <laughs> um, my dad, uh, you know, uh, James Brown said, Papa don't take no mess. That was my dad. I think James Brown probably got that from watching my dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, whatever my dad said was not negotiable. But my dad didn't do timeouts. I didn't know what that was. I still am not sure that I know what that is. <laughs> but, you know, the thing that happened, because I grew up in a home where when he laid down the law, you kept the law. Yeah. Obviously, because I'm still here. Right? <laughs> But when I came to faith in Christ, and they said, listen, he's your heavenly father, that meant to me, whatever he says, you do it. This is no debate. I, I don't get to, to, to rule or reign in on that. Is it, Lord, is this what you want? Yes. Okay. I have to do it. Even those times in my life, earlier in my life, it's not so much of a struggle now, but earlier in my life when... I would come up against the word of God and there would be some character quality or some act of self abnegation That's a nice little saying, stop doing what you're doing. Right? And, and you know, I said, well, Lord, I, I don't want to do it. I know what you say. I did, you know, the thought would come to my mind. The spirit would whisper to my heart, you know, you'll never be happy. Until you give me what I want. Yes, sir. Yes. So I always did that. But now I look at people who, who still feel that somehow they have some wiggle room with the will of God. And I'm saying, well, don't you trust him? Can't, can't you trust God? In fact, we, we were going through a series on the will of God. And I found an old, uh, old uh, PowerPoint. And I put this up in our church. I said, well, look, when you, you look at the attributes of God and the benefits that come to those who follow his will as opposed to their own will, you look at, at the attributes of God because, you know, everything God does flows out of who he is. So if you know who he is, you know his character, you know his attributes, you know his ways, then you know you can trust him. Look at the benefits that come as you know what that to be. The comfort, the discipline, the confidence, the peace, the consolation, the boldness, the success. All those things are possible because of who God is. Yeah. And so the option becomes, do I trust my feeble mind that knows less than nothing about anything? Or do I trust the one who designed everything and knows everything about everything? Hmm, that's such a hard choice. <laughs> <laughs> it just makes common sense to walk with the Lord yeah. and to follow Him. And, and so that decision, that, that first decision, if I'm going to mend, it, it's got to be recognizing and coming to grips with the fact that He's the boss. And I am not. Not the authority. You know, I was in... Port of Alarda. Steve, I was I was playing golf. I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> and you know, they had a caddy there with me. This is a Hispanic guy. And you know, I hit the ball. It didn't go far, but I, I hit it. And um, 
you know, I would walk up and as we get off the car, and he was giving me clubs. I'm like, I don't want that. Give, give, me, give me the eight iron, give me the nine iron. He said, well, no, this is the club you need. I'm like, just give me what I want. And, you know, after two or three holes, we were, we were at a hole, it was probably a par four, and um, one of the guys said, hey, why don't you hit the ball, talking to the caddy. He said, no, 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 they don't let us play. He said, well, that's the way nobody's around. We just, just hit one. He pulled out a club, dropped the ball, and then he teed it up. Swap! Straight, straight man, about three bounces right up on the green. And then he just gave the club back. So after we got to my, my ball, I said, now what club do you do? What? What? Give me some feedback. I mean, he knows what he's doing. Well, listen, God knows what he's doing. And if we trust him, if we have sense enough to trust him, then our lives will begin to mend because he, he'll guide us. He'll lead us in paths of righteousness, ways of peace. The more I know about him, the more I'm willing to trust him. Secondly, my life begins to mend. Well, I guess I need to keep this in my hand. Don't I? My life begins to mend, verse 11, when I recognize the gifts to the church. It says he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. These are, these are gifts, but listen. They're, they're gifted people. God, God has given gifted people Amen. to the church. And the thing that, that, that strikes me so often is how you have people who don't feel like they need to show up at church. They're like, well, you know, I can sit at home in my PJs, right? You know, we talked about that enough, right? But the thing is, in fact, when we had COVID, you know, I struggled with that, right? Carl, you remember, I struggled with that. I'm like, listen, the church is by definition. I mean, ecclesia is a called out assembly. And you're telling us not to assemble. The church assembles. And, you know, then they, I had some blowback from some of my Christian friends. That's right, see, you're, you're, you're not... Walking in love towards people who don't know Christ because you're going to endanger them, yada, yada, yada. Okay. <laughs> so I said, okay, guys, we'll do Zoom. And then, then they did it. They said only the essential people can gather together. Now, as a pharmacist, I was essential. So I still had to go to work. Nothing changed during COVID for me. Right. Same schedule. I went to work every day. It just wasn't nobody else on this busway when I went. <laughs> and when I got there, I mean, they say, wear a mask. I never wore a mask. Man, like, come on. I, well, I won't get into that either. <laughs> Some of you, maybe you lost family um, who, because of COVID. I, I don't know. I don't know. All I know is I went out on the floor. I talked to people. I didn't wear no mask. I was doing everything. Until somebody told them, and they say, uh, you have to wear a mask unless you're eating. So I'm like, all right. So I brought some grapes and nuts and <laughs> put it right in my workstation. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I wasn't wanting to be a rebel, I, I, but I just, I, I thought it was overblown. And I've had conversations with people who insisted it wasn't overblown, and that's okay, too. Uh, but I, I, I never got COVID. And, um, you know, I, I never worried about anything like that. But gifted to people. Uh, so anyway, I guess the, the point that I was going to make in all of that is that the essential people they decided were, you know, the doctors and nurses and the people at the liquor store. <laughs> So I'm like, if the liquor store is essential, <laughs> we we gathering again. So we did. We, we got back together. And, you know, I said, okay, we'll shut all of the doors and shut people in a certain way, make them go by the wash, 
the uh, restroom and make sure they wash 20 minutes, provide them all of this stuff, give them masks because you know some people are going to show up and they got no masks. You know, just, but we did it for a while. And uh, when we came to Atlanta, 2020, right in the midst of COVID, and they said, Pastor, are we going to meet? And they said, yeah, let's meet. And there were people that, that they weren't too comfortable with meeting. And finally, I just said, listen, folks, the bottom line is, be it unto you according to your faith. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't believe that the Lord can keep you safe, then I guess you have to do his own. But we're me. And, and we did, you know. Like Larry Bacchette used to always say, you trust God or do you just say you trust God? I know. Anyway, I didn't intend to say anything about COVID. I'm sorry. Um, get in trouble, but then that's my middle name. <clears throat> I noticed in Exodus 31 that God says to Moses, I've called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. I filled him with the spirit of God and wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all kinds of craftsmanship. To make artistic designs for work in gold and silver and bronze and cutting stones for setting and the carving of wood. That he may work in all kinds of craftsmanship. I myself have appointed with him a holy Abba, the son of Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan. And in the hearts of all who are skillful, I have put skill Amen. that they may make all that I commanded. Amen. So he gave Moses the commandment, but he said, I surrounded you with people to get the job done. And if I understand that God has done so, God has, he surrounded us with capable people and he has filled each person with the spiritual gift. The good thing about that is that every member of the body of Christ can look in a mirror and say, I matter because God has given me something for the benefit of the body. It's important to them that I be there. And it's important to me that I be there. Because when we are together, we all have something good that God has given us to share. And so why would you stay home? When God has equipped you to add value to the people around you. The only reason you will stay home is if you just don't care about people. And if you don't care about people, uh, then you have a problem with the Lord. You know, I'm just saying. And it's like that. I, I want to I wanna be where God wants me to be. And I want to do what God wants me to do. And I want to recognize the value of doing and being what God wants me to do. The gifts to the church, these people are given to establish and edify God's elect. I tell our young people, in fact, I told our not so young people, I said, listen, <clears throat> no matter what it is you have to do in life, I don't care what it is, somebody somewhere has been there, done that, got the t-shirt, right? Somebody knows how to do what you need to get done. Success for you involves humbling yourself to the degree that you go and find them. And come underneath their, learn, their teaching so that you can get what God has stored up for you. Yes, Proverbs 2, it says that, that God gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. What does he store it up? Many times he stores it up in the experiences of the aged. The people who've gone before us. The people who have experienced life and who have a thing or two or three or 25 to teach us. The only problem is with our young people today, many of them, they are, they're surrounded by their own peers and they become their own heroes. And they disconnect from the generation with all of the knowledge and wisdom and understanding and all the things that they need to learn about in life. Anywho, when I understand that God has given me people, people who will build me up, people who will bless my life, people who will help me get where I need to go, and then I want to be a part. I want to gather with them. I just need to see them correctly. I was telling our congregation about this guy who's on his deathbed, and oh my. He was passing away, and 
His wife Evelyn was sitting there. And he looked over. He said, Evelyn, is that you? She said, yes, honey. He said, Evelyn, I was thinking. He says, you know, when we were young and first getting married, how, you know, it was hard for me to find a job and things were really, really tight. Do you remember that? She said, yes. He says, you were right there. I remember a little bit later when, you know, our home caught on fire and we lost everything. But you were right there. She said, yes. He said, a little later on, when my health began to break, Evelyn, you were right there. Yes, I was. He said, Evelyn, I concluded something. What's that? You bad news. <laughs> I was a little better off. So you came into the picture. Sometimes people feel that, that they're better off without the people in the church, without the folk around them, but they're not. You just have to see people like God sees people. You know, God, he's put gifted people around you to build you up, to strengthen you. And you have to just see that correctly. Gifted people are there to help you mend. And if you aren't willing to be guided by that one text, it said the, the equipping, the mending of the saints for the work of service. That's why the church exists. That's why God gives gifted people to the church. In fact, you know, we used to teach um, spiritual gifts. I love this old chart. Uh, it's, it's dated, but I put this up in our church because I wanted to help them realize something. You know, think about it. Think about all of the things that people have going on in their life. Think of all of the things that they need, right? Salvation. Okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. Get back in my lane, okay? Salvation, awareness of sin. People need doctrine. They need to know how. They need shepherding, comforting. They need help. They need financial aid, leadership, fellowship. They need to mature. Yeah. And look at the spiritual gifts. For every need that people have, yeah. God has put someone in the church yeah. to meet the needs. Yeah. The church is the only two institution in the world that is built like that. So when you think about a person and whatever it is they need, then, you know, the best thing you can do for them is to share the gospel and bring them to church. And let the body of Christ minister to them. When I recognize the value of the body of Christ, and I recognize that, that as, we, as we come together and we contribute to one another, we, we begin to, to mend, we begin to heal, we begin to, to bond together, and that bond becomes an unbreakable one that catches other fish. All right. We're able to be successful as a body. Because, you know, God has called us together as a body. We are not a bunch of long rangers. We're not individualists. You know, when a person comes to faith in Christ, the reality is not that they get fire insurance. The reality is that they are grafted into a body. And they belong. And so they need to learn how to fit into what God has designed them to do. Someone said the two most important days in your life are number one, the day you're born, and number two, the day you find out why. Why am I here? What does God want me to do? I love Hebrews 13, 20. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus equip you. That word is again. With all you need for doing whose will? His will. My mission statement revolves around the call of God in my life. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ all that is pleasing to him. Philippians 2.13 says this. It's God who works in you, right? Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Someone courageously said, Lord, I struggle with doing your will, but I'm willing to be made willing 
to do your will. That honest prayer unlocks the heart, and then God moves in the life. Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep who cares deeply about us. By an everlasting covenant signed with his blood, Christ is ultimately shown how valuable that we are. The third thing, of course, the goals of Christian ministry, there, there is a point to all of this. There's a reason that God saves me. So I ask myself, how, how are people torn by the evil one? How are they torn? Well, I sat down and put out some thoughts on my own. From what I see, immature people are deceived into faulty thinking. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they think, well, it's all about me and my wants and my likes. Mm -hmm. And the reality is two things. Number one, it's not about you. Number two, it ain't never been about you. <laughs> well, I guess there's a third one. It ain't ever going to be about you. Right? It's all about him. And Christ is not a genie that comes out when I rub the bottle and gives me three wishes. No. Um, I exist for his glory. Yeah. Then measuring God's goodness by my circumstances, uh -oh. there are people who say God is not good. Look at all the pain and suffering yeah. in the world. And it's true that sometimes God allows sin to manifest itself in the world. Right, right. But that's to highlight the fact that the all lovely one died mm. for that putrid, hated thing called sin. And if we can see sin like God sees sin and hate sin like God hates sin, then number one, we won't moonwalk back into sin. And secondly, we will stand before those who want to go around us and get into sin and say, no brother, no sister. That's not the way to go. And there are people, in fact, I, I work with a lady um, she said, I used, to, I used to go to church. Really, yes, she said, my, my daughter, my young daughter, I think her daughter was about nine, she said she contracted brain cancer, and she died. She said, I've never been to church since. Where was God when my daughter died? Well, of course, the answer was the same place that it was when Jesus hung on the cross. Yeah. Suffering that unspeakable death. But you don't measure God's goodness by your circumstance, right? You measure your circumstance by the promises and, and the goodness of God. And that way you always have hope. And God is called the God of all hope, making people the enemy. <laughs> Who was it that said, people are not the enemy, people are victims of the enemy. And we, we can say that, but we don't always act like that. Sometimes we act like it's do unto others uh, before they do unto you. And we say that that's what the Bible teaches. But it's not, right? And we know that. People are not the enemy. But listen, people are the tools, right? And either, either God uses them for it. Well, God always uses them for his glory. In fact, I'll tell you what, even the EGRs, the extra grace required people, um, God allows them to come into your life. Why? So he can work on you. If, if you didn't need working on, then they wouldn't be in your life. If they're in your life, you need some working on. So you just got to figure that out. Say, so, okay, yeah. You know, it's not the vessel I would have chosen, but you're sovereign. And so you allow them to come into my life, and it's for a season. So, you know, learn your lessons, you know, take the blows and be quiet, and, you know, move on. You know, let them call you. Material possessions will bring fulfillment. We know that's a lie, right? As they say, there's no uh, hearse with the U-Haul attached. You can't take it with you, right? You heard the story about J. Paul Getty when he died, and the people were gathering, all the news reporters, and someone came up to the executive and said, so how much did the old man leave? He said, all of it. Yeah. All of it, right? He didn't take anything with him. And you're not taking anything either, right? And then misapplying my position, right? Misapplying 
my position. You may not see that. It says under there, not resigning. What do I mean by that? You know, sometimes, you know, you have people and they worry about everything. They worry about things that they don't have any control over whatsoever. And I, when I say, well, listen, I've, I've learned not to worry about life. In fact, there, there, are all, there are two things I learned not to worry about. Number one, I don't worry about things I have control over because, you know, I can do something about that. Number two, I don't worry about things I don't have any control over because I can't do anything about that. Right? Anything that falls outside of those two, maybe I worry about. But no, no worry. Why? Because God is sovereign. And he's got under control. And so I, I said to one sister, and she gave me a litany of things. I said to her, maybe you should resign. She said, resign for what? I said, resign your position as general manager of the universe. Because obviously it's beyond you. But, you know, God, can, he, he's been doing that for a while. Let him take care of that. And you, you'll be okay. We, we just have to learn to trust the Lord. Immature people are deceived into faulty thinking. They think worldly, carnally. Broken people are, are disabled. And many times they, they measure God's love by their circumstance. Then sinful people are often disavowed, right? You know, some people come in and you like, uh -huh. right? You come in and you see them and you decide that now's a good time to sit on the other side of the church. Because right? you don't want to be by them, right? And, and sometimes people have done some things, and, and as Christians often do, you see it or you hear about it, and, and then you, you go talk about it. And you don't, you don't love them enough to talk to them about it. Right? Galatians 6.2, I, I love the way it's put in. I love the translation. Um, it says, dear brothers and sisters, if another Christian is overcome by some sin, you are godly, who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Right. They're broken. Yeah. They're disabled. And they're weakened. Yeah. And they don't need condemnation. The world's got enough of that for them. Yeah. Satan's so got all of that they need. Yeah. Yeah. But God has filled us with his love. What does the love of God look like for a brother or a sister who's fallen into sin? It looks like going and getting in their face and saying, listen, you don't belong here. Right. Let's get up and walk together. Yeah. Yeah. I went to visit a brother and his family. They hadn't been to the church in a while. They were in my Sunday school class. And I took a group of, we were teaching them in evangelism, evangelism explosion. We went to visit him. And I talked to him. I said, Keith, you know the Lord loves you and you need to be with us. You belong with us. And we talked for a long time. And he says, Pastor, you're right. I'm coming back to church. We prayed. And Keith prayed this. He said, he said Lord, Thank you for coming after me. He said, I knew you would. Yeah. Wow. She said, Pastor. There are people who, they, they know that they aren't where they ought to be. And they're just wondering if somebody will care enough to get in their face and say, you don't belong here. Right. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's troubles and problems, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. That's another verse that we just don't want to be in the Bible, sharing our troubles and problems. We want to pretend that everything's okay, even though everybody knows you're lying. <laughs> in fact, isn't it true? You walk up to somebody and they say, how you doing? You say, I'm dying. Oh, that's good. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm listening to what you say. He says, if you think you're too important to help someone in need, you're only fooling yourself. You really don't know why. How are people healed? Let me, oh, my time's gone. How are people healed? They heal, number one, by the principles of Scripture. And I appreciate Dr. Ellen today talking about all of that. And, uh, you know, he, well, all he really did was 
talk us into taking his, his workshop. His <laughs> you know, he might as well have just put a sign up that says sign up sheet and here's the price, right? But no, he taught us all the stuff we would learn, all the things that we're ignoramuses about, and then says, okay, if you want help, here, take my class. Okay, so we're all going to sign up, right? <clears throat> but anyway, he talked about the principles found in scripture. And the boy, and I was, man, did not our hearts burn within us as we listened to him expound on that. All scripture is, yeah, all scripture is God breathing. It's profitable to tell us, show us what to believe, where to stand, where we've gone wrong, how to go from being wrong to being right, and how to stay right. We just need the scriptures. And then we need the Spirit's power to work in us. And then we'll get back where. We ought to be. God wants us to grow. He wants us to attain to a unity of the faith. Those three things there. Unity of the faith and knowledge. Uh, that's one of the three things. And the, uh, the ice there points that out. The second thing is to a uh, maturity, a mature man. The third thing is the measure, metron of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And all it's saying is the goals of Christian ministry is unity and knowledge. See, if, if, we, if we all know the truth and we all live in our truth, we stand on the truth, then we'll all be okay. I was telling our folk I probably shouldn't, shouldn't even go into this. Uh, I was telling our folk this story about the lion. He's the king of the beast, right? And so the lion, he goes up to the deer and he says, who's the king of the beast? And the deer calls, you, you are. You are, okay, right. And he goes over here to the giraffe, who's the king of the beast? You are, you are. So, all right, right. Don't make me snap you. But, um, <laughs> he goes over to the tiger, who's the king of the beast? And the tiger said, well, every, everybody knows you are. Said, That's right. He goes up to the elephant. Who's the king of the beast? The elephant wraps his trunk around him, picks him up, turns him upside down, dumps him, steps on him, picked him up again, and threw him against a tree. The lion pulls the stuff up and he says, just because you don't know the answer to the question, you ain't, you ain't got to get all upset. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to live in our truth. We, we just want to help people validate what we say we believe. But God wants us, He wants us to grow in knowledge. He wants us to mature. And we have to live in our truth. He wants us to develop Christ like character so that we are like Christ. So that the world can see Christ. And the church cooperates in that. The church's mission statement is to develop a structure for doing that, for reaching people, for training people, and for deploying people. That's why we say our church is a 3D church, drawing, developing, deploying disciples. And um, Pastor Dr. Victor Clay uh, taught us all about that. Part one, do you notice that? This is part one. If you want the rest of the story, the real skinny on how to do it, then you got to come to the next one. I'm like, yeah, they just game you up. But anyway, it was, it was really good. It was good. It was good. <clears throat> Four things that God uses to grow saints. He used the word of God, obviously. He used prayer, which our president talked about last night. He uses testing. We don't you know, always think about the value of that. But you never learn anything from the things that you do right or do well. You only learn from your struggles. You know? So God, he programs in struggles. He programs in suffering as well. The psalmist says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But not no more. Now I keep your word. Right? Paul says in Philippians 2, I believe 29, or 129, he says, for you it has been granted on the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his name's sake. He that has suffered, Peter says, has ceased from sin, stopped sinning. 
God has to burn off all the dross. The goal, the end result, the teleos, is a person who has attained moral maturity in a perverse, immoral world, the goal for which he was intended, namely to be a person who is obedient to Christ, who loves Christ with everything within him. The writer of Hebrews says solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. And the only way to get that is you get in the book, the book gets in you, you get into the body, you experience body life, you appreciate who God has around you and what you can learn from them. You come not to get your praise on only you come to give yeah. and to receive yeah. right? yeah. in that order because more blessed to give than to receive last slide oh, did I go the wrong way no oh never mind each believer functions in accord with Christ's gift <clears throat> the body as a whole enjoys unity and becomes more spiritually mature more like Christ in all his fullness. Paul says we'll no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We won't be influenced by people when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ who was the head of the body, his body, the church. And that's that's the goal. Amen. And that's, that's why we're here, right? Amen. That we may learn how to appreciate and build up one another. <clears throat> I was talking to one of the young men in our church and uh, his graduation, and I was saying, let me share with you this story that I read about the pencil. <clears throat> Oops. You know I'm done because I closed my body. Right? <laughs> In the beginning, the pencil maker spoke to the pencil and he says, "These are there are five things you need to know before I send you out into the world. Always remember them and you will become the best pencil you can be. First, you'll be able to do many great things, but only if you allow yourself to be held in someone else's hand. If I don't allow God to take me, shape me, and use my life, then I've wasted my life. Second, you will experience a pain for sharpening from time to time. Christ does prune, John 15, but he does it to increase our fruitfulness. But this is required if you want to become a better pencil. Third, you have the ability to correct any mistakes you make. Only a fool, when he gets knocked down, stands back up and doesn't duck the next time. Right? <clears throat> you learn when you get dead, yes, right? You learn to duck. And, and that's part of the growth process. Fourth, and the most important thing, the most important part of you will always be what's inside. Always. Christ drives his word into the heart. And then it transforms the life. Our society spends all this time doing reformation, excuse me, yeah, reformation. But God does transformation. Yes, sir. And then people, they stay fixed. And fifth, no matter what the condition, you must continue to write. Don't, don't let Satan stop you. Don't let circumstances stop you. Don't let disorderliness stop you. There are a number of things that you can always be angry, mad, upset about. Don't let them stop you. Leave a clear, legible mark no matter how difficult the situation. Let God use you to accomplish his will in his world for his glory. Father, thank you so much again for this day. Thank you for this time. And Father, I pray that uh, even as we um, go and spend some time doing whatever it is, will allow us to spend time today and as we wind up tomorrow and as we return, uh, may we return strengthened, refreshed, rejuvenated, 
but more deeply committed to walking with you and allowing you to use us for your honor and your glory. Strengthen us as the people of God. We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. 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 Amen.